We lived on 110 acres of cotton, corn, and peanut fields in a little corner of Pike County, Alabama. My father bought it in the spring of 1940 for $300 cash. It was every penny my father had to his name, money earned by tenant farming. My father was a sharecropper. I never had any feelings about the other animals on our farm, but I was always drawn to the chickens. I never took the chickens straight to the yard to feed them. I felt the need to talk to them first. No one else could tell those chickens apart and no one cared to. There were Rhode Island Reds, Dominiques, and Bantams. I knew every one of them by appearance and personality. They were each individuals to me. Some I even named. Big Bell, for instance, fell down the well. It took us five days to get her out. We finally put some breadcrumbs in a basket and lowered it down. Darn if she didn't climb right into that basket. Then there was Lil Pullet, my favorite. She lived longer than any other bird I had. Everywhere I went around the chicken yard, Lil Pullet would be right there behind me. Springtime was my favorite time of year because it was the only season we could get baby chicks. When the hens began laying their eggs, I'd mark each one with a lightly penciled number to help keep track of its progress during the three weeks it took to hatch. The numbers were always odd, never even. I had been told never to put an even number under a sitting hen. It was bad luck. And I would cheat on those setting hens. I'd take a few from the hens that were setting on a large number of eggs and slip them under the hens that weren't. This cut down on the number of bad eggs. I also learned that a hen will continue to set as long as she has eggs underneath her. So by setting more eggs under her hens, I was able to keep them setting for another three weeks. Stretching out that process is not natural, and it took a toll. So I built a makeshift incubator. I always hoped to save enough money for an actual incubator, like the 1895 model advertised in the Sears Roebuck catalog. We called that catalog our wish book. I fell asleep many nights, dreaming about it the way other children dreamed about bicycles and dollhouses, but I was never able to afford it. Yes? If you love chicken so much, why didn't you become a chicken farmer? Hmm, I suppose there are many reasons. Growing up, what I really wanted to be was a preacher. An uncle gave me a Bible for Christmas when I was four. And yes, I do remember when I was four. I'll never forget my mother reading aloud to me the first words in that book. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. By the time I was five, I could read it myself. And one phrase struck me strongly, though. I couldn't comprehend its full meaning at the time. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So I preached to my chickens just about every night. I would get them into the hen house and settle them on their roosts. They would sit quietly. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. They would bow their heads, they would shake their heads. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. But they would never quite say amen. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. I imagined that they were my congregation. And me? Blessed are they which were persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I was a preacher. Of course, anyone can figure out the danger of making pets out of farm animals, especially chickens. You get emotionally attached to an animal destined for the dinner table, and you're asking for a broken heart. But I couldn't help it. More often than I liked, a grown hen 
or even a chick would die of more natural causes. For these birds, I would conduct a funeral. This was not child's play. I was genuinely grief-stricken, and the services were painstakingly precise. I would gather whichever of my sisters and brothers and cousins I could, and I would deliver a eulogy. My parents would watch the newest tiny coffin join the neat row of small dirt-mounded graves and wonder what kind of son they had. I even went through a period of performing baptisms. I was truly intent on saving the little bird souls. On one occasion, I was too intense. I guess I misjudged the time. I was shocked, absolutely terrified. I had taken one of my innocent babies and actually killed it. I didn't know what to do. In my panic, I hoped somehow the sun's heat might dry its feathers and maybe revive it. Incredibly, it did. I'd never felt more guilt than I did that day. All these aspects of my chicken play tickled my parents at first, but their amusement vanished as I began seriously protesting their own treatment of the birds. From time to time, they would have no cash to pay for the Rolling Stone Man for some sorely needed sugar or flour, so they would offer a bird in barter instead. One of my chickens. I'd cry, refuse to speak to them for the rest of the day, even skip that evening's meal. Worse, though, was watching my mother or father kill one of the chickens for a special Sunday dinner. They would either break its neck with their hands, spinning it around until the bone snapped, or simply chop the head off. They would then drain the blood from its body and dip it in boiling water, scalding it to loosen its feathers for plucking. I was nowhere to be seen at those family meals. So you stopped raising chickens because it was too hard to see them be killed? No, the death of those chickens was just a part of life. But eventually, I began studying more, doing schoolwork, and my eyes began opening to the world around me. But why did you need to study more? Did you fail your tests? Jacob, shh. What? I did okay. I wasn't the best. But school was important to me, and it ultimately was the reason I got involved in the civil rights movement. <laughs>